Voices from the Cloud. We are back at it again. Last week, uh, Dr. Tyler Plaxico came and spoke about Wesley Glenn and did a fantastic job. And this week, we are headed back to our series, Voices from the Cloud. And we're reminding ourselves of those words from the 12th chapter of Hebrews that says, Therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Basically, Hebrews reminds us that that there have been a whole host of people who have gone on before us. They have run the race of life well faithfully, and they have endured. And their accomplishments, their journey should give us hope and courage, knowing that God was with them and that God will be with us. In a way, Hebrews uh, is that great reminder that all the faithful who have completed their race are in the crowds cheering us on as we continue our life's journey. And so we as a church, we have been taking uh, some time this summer, just like the writer of Hebrews, to point a few people out uh, looking at those long ago who were in the Hebrew Bible to hear what word, what lesson, uh, what, what advice, what encouragement they might share with us as we take a lap around the track with them. And so we've looked at at David and Ruth and Joseph and Esther and Daniel. And today we're going to look at one of the kings, King Josiah. But before we get into the text this morning, it's important to know uh, the time, the place, the context of what is, has and is going on uh, in Israel and Judah and how this makes Josiah's reform all the more earth-shattering. So if we get in our minds, we're thinking back to the year is, is 622 B.C., 100 years after the northern kingdom of Israel had fallen uh, and were defeated and brought into exile by the Assyrians. Now why would something like that happen? Was this part of God's plan all along, one might ask? And I would say, no, this was not God's intended will for Israel. For we know time and time again, God had sent prophets uh, to say, listen, we need to change. We need to do things differently. We need to get back to that covenant promise and worship God alone. And prophet after after prophet had come and gone and even went as far as to say, if we don't, if we don't follow, if we miss out on this covenant promise of God, there are going to be consequences. And so they had been given many opportunities uh, to course correct by God, uh, but the northern kingdom of Israel would not listen. And their deliberate worship of other gods led to their demise. Now, down the road uh, was Judah, and that is where we are today, the southern kingdom. Now, one would think, after seeing what happened to your neighbors up north, Judah would have received the message loud and clear. And... They would have seen the pain that Israel had gone through. You would think that would give them a wake-up call, so to speak. Well, it didn't work. It didn't really work that way. Sure, there was this occasional good king that came along here and there from time to time. But, but Judah was traversing the same path Israel had taken. Bad kings came to power. And the people of Judah did what was right in their own eyes. But then, a new king came to power. A different kind of leader. And that is where we pick up 
uh, in 2 Kings chapter 22. Let's hear the word of the Lord. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Jedidiah, daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all in the way of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. And in the 18th year of King Josiah, the king sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, son of Meshulam, the secretary to the house of the Lord, saying, Go up to the high priest Helkiah and have him count the entire sum of money that has been brought into the house of the Lord. Now here the text goes on and explains what they do with that money. The, they've been receiving tithes and offerings, and Josiah says, look, use it. Get this place in order. The temple was a wreck. They, they had neglected the worship of God, and, and Josiah says, use it. I don't care what it costs. I trust the people doing the work. Give them the money uh, and fix the temple. But something happened as they were fixing the temple. And I would like for us to go on to verse 8. And it says, The high priest Helkiah said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. When Helkiah gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. Then Shaphan the secretary came to the king and reported to the king, Your servants have emptied out uh, the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of the workers who have oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the secretary informed the king, and the priest Hilkiah has given me a book. Shaphan then read it aloud to the king. Skipping on to chapter 23. The king directed all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem should be gathered to him and the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him went all the people of Judah, all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests, the prophets, all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord, keeping his commandments, his decrees, and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book. And all the people joined in covenant. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our thanks be to God. When we read this story, we see Josiah is a leader who honestly who's able to honestly evaluate where Judah was and their relationship with God. Just upon hearing the book of the law, Josiah realized, realizes how far his people have slipped away. No longer could they say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. For they had built idols and constructed high places, they worship the Baals. They worship the gods of their neighbors. Years after years of slipping. The quest for power and wealth. The disregard of the widow and the orphan. The sacrifices given without regard for true, authentic worship. The dabbling around with foreign gods slowly drifting away. Judah found themselves no longer being set apart and holy as a kingdom of priests to the nations around them. Instead, they were very much the same, undistinguishable from the crowd. I think the story of Judah is, is an all too familiar story, isn't it? We, too, find it just as easy to slip out of sorts, don't we? To get out of habit. To find ourselves having drifted away in an unintended direction. 
We know that happens outside of faith. Um, just the other day, I was getting a routine physical, you know, that yearly exam by the doc. Um, and we were going over my numbers, and they were pretty good. Um, I'm a young guy, and I try to watch things. Um, but we were talking, and, and the doc casually brought up this. He says, I'm, I'm 32. He says, you know, around 20 years old, the average person uh, finds it, it, it's really easy to, to add one or two pounds uh, on the, onto their weight every year. And he says, now that doesn't seem like much, but, but by the time you're 50 and you've put on 30 pounds or better, it becomes a lot harder to deal with. It was sort of an ouch, amen moment. It was one of those bringing my attention, hey, this is an easy, slippery slope uh, to follow. Or maybe, maybe we see that drifting uh, in relationships. After a move or a major life change happens, you're, you're around a person, a person a lot less, and, and it wears on that friendship a little bit. And then that regularly uh, made phone call, that weekly phone call turns into that sporadic, whenever there's a spot of boredom or free time, I'll, I'll, I'll give them a call. And then maybe the occasional card for the birthday always followed and cushioned with that apology of, hey, I know I need to get better about keeping up. Let's, let's do that. Let's, let's talk more regularly. And it continues to drift, drift on. The life of faith can drift from us too. Our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, even our witness. Those pieces which we covenant with God and one another can slowly become less of a priority in our lives and fall on the back burner. Faith sort of shifts and becomes more like the dessert rather than the entree that we are to consume. Or maybe it's like an accessory rather than the outfit by which we clothe ourselves in baptism. It's not because we wake up deciding we are no longer in need of faith or that we purposefully want to lose a close friendship, relationship, to put on extra weight. I don't believe the people of Israel or Judah woke up one morning and said, let's forget God altogether. It sort of just happens and we lose track of what is most important. The kings did that in their leadership. And it affected the nation. And we do that in our own lives. And so when Josiah hears the law, the covenant that God had made with the people, Scripture says he tore his clothes and was moved to tears. He mourned because his people had drifted so far away. And I don't believe his sadness was over the consequences of what was to come for Judah. But his sadness, his mourning was because he realized they missed out on years of being in right relationship with God, of walking closely with God. And and if it was about the consequences, Josiah would have just thrown his hands up and said, hey, we're we're past fixing this. Let's just keep doing things the way they are. So Josiah grieves this missed opportunity, but he doesn't linger there. He doesn't wallow in shame. He's not paralyzed by guilt. Josiah makes efforts to start with the clean slate. And so he gathers all the people at the pillars of the temple um, and reads the book of the law which they found and makes covenant with God. And the people followed his leadership and made that covenant as well. And we know this, this wasn't just lip service. This was Josiah really living it out. It, it, he, he went throughout the country tearing down the high places and, and the altars and quit the idol worship. And if just for a little while longer, Judah was spared from captivity. I think if Josiah were here today and walking around the track with us, he would say to us, honestly evaluate where you are. Be real with yourself, honest with yourself, and renew your covenant often. 
Honesty is essential. And when we're not willing to recognize and name the places of our faith where we have drifted, we will have so much, a so much harder time getting back on course. Whether it's in our prayer life, when we're honest and realize maybe all I'm doing is asking. I'm not listening. I'm not being present anymore with God. Maybe it's being honest with how we wrestle with God's Word or being intentional to make time with community. It's less about pointing out our deficiencies, though, but responding in gratitude to the call and the grace of God on our lives because it it is a call that draws us back and draws us deeper. But it must start with an honest picture of where we are at the present. I want to speak real quickly. Honesty is is so important. And and there's a story, Atul Gwande um, is a doctor and a medical expert, and he realized that there are a lot of Uh, issues sometimes in the medical field. Sometimes things don't go the way that you want them to go and realize that the number of deaths and and injuries that occur in medical procedures uh, was was a lot higher than it needed to be. And what he did was he put together a list, um, a checklist, a way to get back to the basics for those surgeons and doctors. Uh, And the WHO, the World Health Organization, adopted this list and saw tremendous amount of improvement. In fact, South Carolina and 14 hospitals that implemented his checklist, they had a 22% decrease in surgical uh, deaths. That's a a big number, a big, um, big reduction in deaths. And I just wanted to share with you a couple of those things really quickly. One, figure out who the patient is. Have the nurses and the doctor name who the patient they're working on is. That's, that seems like a legitimate step. Um, then there were, there were some others. There was uh, uh, mark the place where you're going in to do surgery. You don't want to go in and do surgery on the right arm when they needed their left arm done. I mean, that makes sense. You, you follow the basics. And, and there are steps all along in this checklist of, of helping the doctors uh, and the surgeons return to the very most basic pieces of the procedure. I think that's exactly what Josiah wanted the people of Judah to do. When they re- reaffirmed their covenant with God, realizing where they were, but starting afresh, saying from this day forth, we will live our lives to honor God in all things with all our heart and with all our soul, as the scripture says. 